guys, actually, though, you don't know that you gave me the topic. Um, I checked out one of your YouTube channels, and one of you were talking about how you have, um, I'm going to probably mispronounce this a lot, but hydrocephalus, and I didn't really know anything about that, and um, I wanted to learn more, and somebody had requested a Wiki Wednesday Whispers video today. And I thought I'm gonna be reading. So Wikipedia, I got a new microphone mount that I wanted to try out, and I thought, um, why not do them together? So we're gonna get started uh, without too much to do. Okay. So hydrocephalus uh, is a medical condition in which there is an abnormal accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. This causes in, causes increased intracranial pressure inside the skull and may cause progressive enlargement of the head if it occurs in childhood, potentially causing convulsion, tunnel vision, and mental disability. It was once informally called water on the brain. Two types of hydrocephalus are commonly described, non-communicating hydrocephalus and communicating hydrocephalus. Although there is evidence that communicating forms can lead to obstruction of the CSF flow in many instances. In non-communicating hydrocephalus, the CSF in the ventricles cannot reach the subarachnoid space. This results from obtrusion of intervecular fermata cerebral aqueduct or the outflow of a foramen for the, of the fourth ventricle. The most common obstruction is in the cerebral aqueduct. A block at any of these sites leads rapidly to dilation of one or more ventricles. If the skull is still pliable as it is in children younger than two years, the head may enlarge. In communicating hydrocephalus, the obstruction of CSF flow is in the subarachnoid space brought from prior bleeding or meningitis. This causes thickening of the arachnoid, leading to blockage of the return flow channels. In some patients, the spaces filled by CSF are uniformly enlarged without an increase in the intracranial pressure. This special form of communicating hydrocephalus is called normal pressure hydrocephalus, NPH, which results specifically from impaired CSF reabsorption at the arachnoid granulations. NPH's clinical manifestations are gait abnormality, dementia, and involuntary urination. NPH usually occurs in elderly patients. Medical Wikipedia articles have so many words that are so hard to pronounce. Uh, also, this is the furthest I think I've ever used this mic from uh, reading, so let me know how the distance is. Signs and symptoms. The clinical presentation of hydrocephalus varies with chronicity. Acute dilation of the ventricular system is more likely to manifest with non-specific signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. By contrast, chronic dilation, especially in the elderly population, may have a more insidious onset presenting. For instance, with Occam's triad or Adam's triad. Symptoms of increased intracranial pressure may include headaches, vomiting, nausea, papilledemia, sleepiness, or coma. Elevated intracranial pressure may result in uncal or cerebral tonsil herniation with resulting life-threatening brainstem compression. Hockman's triad of gait instability, urinary incontinence, and dementia is a relatively typical manifestation of the distinct entity normal pressure hydrocephalus for neurological defects focal neurological defects may also occur such as abducens nerve palsy and vertical gaze palsy uh, baronet syndrome due to compression
compression of the quadrumino plate, where the neural centers coordinating the conjugated vertical eye movement are located. The symptoms depend on the cause of the blockage, the person's age, and how much brain tissue has been damaged by the swelling. In infants with hydrocephalus, CSF builds up in the central nervous system, causing the fontanelli soft spot to bulge and the head to be larger than expected. Early symptoms may also include eyes that appear to gaze downward, irritability, seizures, separated sutures, sleepiness, vomiting. Symptoms that may occur in older children can include brief, shrill, high-pitched cry, changes in personality, memory, or the ability to reason or think, changes in facial appearance and eye spacing, crossed eyes or uncontrolled eye movements, difficulty feeding, excessive sleepiness, headache, irritability, poor temper control, loss of bladder control, loss of coordination and trouble walking, muscle spasticity, slow growth, slow or unrestricted movement, vomiting. Because hydrocephalus can injure the brain, thought and behavior may be adversely affected. Learning disabilities, including short-term memory loss, are common among those with hydrocephalus, who tend to score better on verbal IQ than on performance IQ, which is thought to reflect the distribution of nerve damage to the brain. However, the severity of hydrocephalus can differ considerably between individuals, and some are of average or above average intelligence. Someone with hydrocephalus may have motion and visual problems, problems with coordination, or may be clumsy. They may reach puberty earlier than the average child. About one in four develops epilepsy. Um, I'm going to skip down to treatment. I'm going to skip over some about the mechanisms, causes, and the two different types. Hydrocephalus treatment is surgical. Generally, utilizing various types of cerebral shunts. It involves the placement of a ventricular catheter, a tube made of elastic into the cerebral ventricles to bypass the flow, obstruction, and malfunctioning arachnoidal granulations and drain the excess fluid into other bodies, body cavities from where it can be reabsorbed. Most shunts drain the fluid into the prenoidal cavity but alternative sites include the right atrium, trileural cavity, and gallbladder. A shunt system can also be placed in the lumbar space of the spine and have the CSF redirected to the prenoidal cavity. An alternative treatment for obstructive hydrocephalus in selected patients is the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, whereby a surgically created opening in the floor of the third ventricle allows the CSF to flow directly to the basal cisterns, thereby shortcutting any obstruction as in aquidonal stenonitis. Uh, this may or may not be appropriate based on individual anatomy. Oh, it's really hot in here, guys. Shot complication. Examples of possible complications include shunt malfunction, shunt failure, and shunt infection, along with infection of the shunt tract following surgery. The most common reason for shunt failure is infection of the shunt tract. Although a shunt generally works well, it may stop working if it disconnects, becoming blocked, infected, or it is outgrown. If this happens, the spinal fluid will begin to accumulate again and a number of physical symptoms will develop. Some extremely serious like seizures. The shunt failure rate is also relatively high. Of the 40,000 surgeries performed annually to treat hydrocephalus, only 30% are a patient's first surgery and it is uncommon for patients to have multiple shunt revision. It is not uncommon for patients to have multiple shunt revisions within their lifetime. Another complication can occur when CSF drains more rapidly than it is produced by choroid plexus, causing symptoms uh, listlessness, severe headaches, irritability, light sensitivity, auditory hypothesia, sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, vertigo, migraine, seizures, a change of personality, weakness, 
tightness in the arms or legs, strabismus, and double vision to appear when the patient is vertical. If the patient lies down, the symptoms usually vanish quickly. A CT scan may or may not show any change in ventricle size, particularly if the patient has a history of slit-like ventricles. Difficulty in diagnosing overdrainage can make treatment of this complication particularly frustrating for patients and their families. Resistance to addition, traditional analgesic pharmacological therapy may also be a sign of shunt overdrainage or failure. The diagnosis of a cerebrospinal fluid buildup is complex and requires specialist expertise. Diagnosis of the particular complication usually depends on when the symptoms appear. That is, whether symptoms occur when the patient is upright or in a prone position with the head at roughly the same level as the feet. Uh, let's read history. References to hydrocephalic skulls can be found in ancient Egypt medical literature, literature from 2500 BC to 500 AD. Hydrocephalus was described more clearly by the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates in the 4th century BC, while a more accurate description was later given by the Roman physician Galen in the 2nd century AD. The first clinical description of an operative procedure for hydrocephalus appears in the al tarisif uh, 1080 by the Arab surgeon Ablakasis, who clearly described the evacuation of superficial intracranial fluid in hydrocephalic children. He described it in his chapter on neurolog neurosurgical disease, described infantile hydrocephalus as being caused by mechanical compression. He wrote, uh, This skull of a newborn baby is often full of liquid, either because the matron has compressed it excessively or for other unknown reasons. The volume of the skull then increases daily so that the bones of the skull fail to close. In this case, we must open the skull in three places, make the liquid flow out, then close the wound and tighten the skull with a bandage. In 1881, a few years after the landmark study of Wrights and Key, Carl Weiner group pioneered sterile ventricular puncture and external drainage of cerebrospinal fluid for the treatment of hydrocephalus. It remained in the intractable condition until the 20th century when shunts and other neurosurgical treatment modalities were developed. It is a lesser known medical condition. Relatively little least research is conducted to improve treatment and there is still no cure. In developing countries, the condition often goes untreated at birth. Before birth, the condition is difficult to diagnose and there is limited access to medical treatment. However, when the head swelling is prominent, children are taken at great expense for treatment. By then, brain tissue is underdeveloped, is undeveloped, and neurosurgery is rare and difficult. Children more commonly live, live with undeveloped brain tissue and consequently intellectual disability. <laughs> Sorry guys. Society and culture. These are our last uh, couple sections. Awareness campaign. September was designated National Hydrocephalus Awareness Month in July 2009 by the U.S. Congress in H.R. 373. The resolution campaign is due in part to the advocacy work of the Pediatric Hydrocephalus Foundation, Incorporated. Prior to July 2009, there was no awareness month for this condition. Many of the hydrocephalus organizations within the United States use various ribbon designs as a part of their awareness and fundraising activities. Exceptional cases. One interesting case of hydrocephalus was a man whose brain shrank to a thin sheet of tissue due to buildup of cerebrospinal fluid in his skull. As a child, the man had a shunt, but it was removed when he was 14. In July 2007, at age 44, he went to the hospital due to mild weakness in his left leg. When doctors learned of the man's medical history, they performed a computed tomography, or CT scan, and magnetic resonant MRI scan, and were astonished to see massive enlargement of the lateral ventric ventricles in the skull. Dr. Lionel Flute of Abdel in 
Marcel said the images were most unusual. The brain was virtually absent. Intelligence tests showed the patient an IQ of 75 below the average score of 100. This would be considered borderline intellectual functioning, just above what would be officially considered mentally challenged. The patient was a married father of two children and worked as a civil servant, leading an at least superficially normal life, despite having enlarged ventricles with a decreased volume of brain tissue. What I find amazing to this day is how the brain can deal with something which you think would be not compatible with life, commented Dr. Max Mukin, a pediatric brain def defect specialist at the National Human Genome Research Institute. If something happens very slowly over quite some time, many, maybe over decades, the different parts of the brain take up functions that would normally be done by the part that is pushed to the side. So, that is the end of uh, the article on hydrocephalus. So I hope that you guys have really enjoyed this. Um, I know it's a little bit heavier of a topic than we normally do uh, for Wiki Wednesday Whispers, but it was something that I really wanted to learn about. And I know for at least one of you, it's a really big part of your life. And uh, I wanted to learn more about it. And, you know, if I can help raise you know, a little bit of awareness about um, a condition that is not very well known, then I want to do that. So, thank you guys for watching. Uh, I think you know who this video is for. Uh, I think you know it's for you. And I hope that you've enjoyed it. So, otherwise, that's all I have.